Of course, governments can talk tough and you know pass uh, legislation which uh, you know introduces uh, tougher sentences. But uh, part of the problem is the the judiciary handing out you know these uh, you know light uh, sentences to you know Afri African youths. You know they get you know community orders, and as we've seen, they you know get bail when they you know commit you know violent offences. There seems to still, uh, be this you know cultural view in the legal profession that you know it's cruel to lock up you know any type of use that are you know they're they're just you know troubled people who um you know or if we send them to uh jail that'll you know harden them harden them up more when the the reality is that you know probably these you know young people if they are to be rehabilitated they need to you know go to jail so they can have you know access to some of these you know rehabilitation programs and you know so it is a uh not only a deterrent you know keeps the community community safe. I mean, we really need a cultural change in our legal profession that, you know, really puts the, uh, you know, needs, needs and safety uh, of the community first and realises that sometimes, you know, jail is just what a person needs. Well, yes. I mean, I personally am somewhat sceptical of this narrative that uh, prison is there as a, a means of rehabilitating particular members of society. Um, I think particularly in particularly in this case, I would be in prison as a way of just keeping everyone else safe. I think if you're the sort of person who's breaking another person's home at 2 a.m., um, you know, hold a machete to their property, I don't think you're the sort of person that can be um, effectively rehabilitated personally. Uh, maybe I don't have enough faith in our justice system. Um, you know, perhaps that's the case. But as I said, for me personally, the priority is just keeping other people safe. The priority is ensuring that other people don't have to uh, experience these same traumatic events. And as I said, I think that uh, our politicians and also, as you mentioned, our, uh, our judiciary as well, very much have a responsibility to ensure that that happens. Uh, I don't think we should be emphasising the, uh, the rights or the individual freedoms of the criminals in this case. Um, I think as, as far as I'm concerned, if they're willing to behave in such a way, then they don't really, I don't think they're really entitled to these rights and freedoms. Um, so, yes, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I don't even think that prison is an adequate um, approach. I think, uh, particularly in cases where these are immigrants from other countries, I would rather we just deported them. And we have every right to do that on the basis of international law. We can quite easily just send these people back to Sudan. They are Sudanese citizens as well, keep in mind. Um, so, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, I wouldn't even want to be paying tax to, um, to maintain their standard of living in Australia. I wouldn't be wanting to pay tax so that they can rot away in a prison for 20 years. Um, I don't think that's, no, like, I don't think that's fair, to be honest with you. And like I said, there are other, you know, alternative solutions available. And yeah, as I said, uh, I just, I can't fathom why anyone would oppose the deportation of a violent criminal. It's just, it's absurd to suggest otherwise. Yeah, if we can deport them and get them, you know, off our hands, then, you know, we should definitely uh, do it. And uh, I notice these lefties say, oh, you know, why don't you, you know, deport, you know, white uh, criminals? Well, uh, the thing is, if they're Australian citizens, you know, we can't. Like, uh, it would be great if we could, you know, deport, you know, every, you know, violent criminal we have in Australia. But when the option is available to us, yeah, we want to make sure that, you know, they're not our problem anymore and they, they go back to the uh, go back to the place where you know ba basically all these problems started exactly yes um as i mentioned before i you know i can i can appreciate uh, the humanitarian aspect up to a certain point i can appreciate the idea of being charitable towards those who are less fortunate but obviously you need to draw the line somewhere and when you're actively importing people who are um quite clearly violent criminals um, I, yeah, I think that that's where I sort of draw the line. Um, and I don't really have any sympathy for anyone, regardless of what they've been through. Anyone who wants to break into another person's home and violently threaten them with machetes and whatever else, I don't care what you've been through. Um, I think they've got to go back. And I make no apologies for holding that view. And uh, I think another issue that needs to be explored is that uh, youth offenders should uh, face the same laws and as punishment and punishments as uh, adults. Because, uh, and this was put forward by uh, Peter Ferris QC, who's a uh, retired conservative uh, barrister. He talked about how these youth offenders they know that you know they'll go before the children's court, you know, get a light sentence, and so they can pretty much you know act up until they're you know eighteen. And like 
for, uh, uh, you know, a 16-year-old, for example, is you know, capable of committing, you know, uh, as horrific, you know, violent offences as an adult. And, you know, I, I think, and basically the impact on, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, if you're being attacked by a 16 or an 18-year-old, it's still, it's still a traumatic event for you. And I think that the perpetrator, no matter their age, should face the same consequences. Well, I mean, you mentioned that, uh, that age of 18. I believe that there are actually examples or incidents in which uh, there were grown men in their 20s um, who were committing crimes and being uh, charged in the same way that a, a so-called youth would, and they were being sent to youth detention rather than adult prison. Now, as I said, these are grown men in their 20s. These are adults. These are not children. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's not even really in, uh, a cutoff of 18. Uh, I've heard about, you know, 21-, 22-year-olds who are... Uh, treated as used by the courts. Uh, now, as you said, you really can't differentiate that. I mean, you know, most of these people, they, you know, they, they're no longer in school, they're working jobs, they're, um, they're very much adults in every sense of the word. So I don't, I don't quite buy into this narrative that they're, um, they're supposedly used and therefore entitled to uh, some sort of different treatment. And of course, we need to look at the issue of further immigration uh, to Africa. The, obviously, the talk in the past couple of years is about you know stopping you know Muslim immigration. But you know the, the Australian people there, or uh, I should say more specifically, the Victorian people. You know they're they're starting to get you know really angry that you know this you know is a problem that our governments had foisted on us, you know, imported you know, into Australia. And, you know, why would we, given this problem, like, why would we want to, you know, keep, you know, importing more? Like, and yes, you've, you've spoken uh, about, you know, uh, the humanitarian aspect of it, but it should always be, um, you know, the, the Australian people first. And, you know, if, if, you know, if the cost of, you know, rescuing, you know, refugees from the other side of the world is, you know, putting the safety of Australian citizens at risk, then I would say it's not worth it for us. Well, yes, it really does speak volumes about the simplicity of the uh, mainstream immigration debate which exists in Australia. I mean, we were willing to have a good what, month or two in which um, gay marriage dominated the, uh, the realm of the, the mainstream political discourse in Australia. And I think people really are overlooking the, uh, the more concerning and legitimate political issues which exist here. Now, as I said, if you look at the mainstream discourse in relation to immigration, it doesn't really get any more sophisticated than, you know, stop the boats or let them stay. And that's pretty much it. Um, ideally, I would want to see a, um, a debate or a national conversation, which is, I suppose, which places more of an emphasis on differentiating between different types of immigration. I mean, you have skilled immigration, you have unskilled immigration, you have immigration from English-speaking nations and non-English-speaking nations, you have immigration from developed countries and undeveloped countries. I think we need to start differentiating between these different types of immigration. Now, clearly an immigrant from, say, for example, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, the US, or the uh, Canada even, for example, I think people from these particular countries are going to be far more likely to integrate effectively within Australian culture. Similarly, if you're um, you know, importing people with a, uh, a qualification of some sort, let's just say an engineer or a doctor, a lawyer, someone who is obviously well qualified. I think that, once again, people with these sorts of backgrounds are going to be um, far more likely to integrate effectively. And once again, we should probably place more of a priority on, um, on immigration from these particular backgrounds. But like I said, if you look at the mainstream discourse, in relation to immigration in Australia. No one wants to talk about this. No one wants to discuss these issues. And it's really just as simple as, oh, stop the boats or let them stay. And I just, I can't fathom that Australian mainstream political discourse has become that unsophisticated and that basic that people won't, won't consider anything deeper than just that. I mean, it's the elephant in the room. It is the major issue facing this country right now. It is the major socio-political transformation which is occurring in Australia. And I think the, the, the country that you and I grew up in, you know, back in the, the 90s and 2000s, I think that that country no longer exists. And I think it's a, a massive shame. And I think that we can quite clearly blame mass immigration policies on that fact. This has been an Unshackled Fast. Please like, comment and subscribe. While you're here, grab our free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and visit theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.